me amaste en la eternidad pintaste todo con tu amor y el pincel fue tu Desde el primer error, antes de la oscuridad, cambiaste el trono por dolor, tu sangre por mi libertad, nada ni nadie podrá separarme. Amor y tu verdad, ni lo más alto, ni lo profundo, la muerte o la vida no podrá. No, antes no podía ver que todo. Ahora puedo comprender que en ti soy más que vencedor, que en ti soy más que vencedor, nada ni nadie podrá separarme de tu amor. Salto, ni lo profundo, la muerte o la vida no podrá. Ni mis errores, ni mi pasado, ninguna sombra de maldad, ni mis temores, ni preocupación. Tu paz puedo sentir, veía al amor del Padre, va llenando mi interior, Él es mi ayudador, la fuerza mi debilidad, eso, Espíritu es de mí, tu paz puedo sentir.
God bless you. Thanks for joining us at Church Online. I hope that you're doing well. If you're part of our Nuevo Monastery Church family, I want to say welcome home. And if it's your first time joining us via this medium, I want to welcome you personally. My name is Aníbal Figueroa. I'm the pastor of Nuevo Amanecer Church. And it really is a great pleasure and an honor to have you with us this morning. I often say that we are a church filled with imperfect people that seek the face of the Lord often so that he may make us more like Christ. And it is our aim as a church, our purpose to bridge the gap between Christ and all people. So wherever you are in life or wherever you are in your relationship with God or wherever you're watching us from, I want you to know that you are welcome. I'm excited about today. We are actually in part two of a message series titled Spiritual Warfare, in which we are studying what spiritual warfare looks like in in a day-to-day basis because as we established last week that spiritual warfare doesn't always look like in the movies it's not always something crazy you know supernatural paranormal activity but more often than not it's actually very subtle and you and I are probably engaging in this warfare probably more often than we even realize so how it is that we can combat against it. We're looking at some powerful truths and principles in scripture that we can apply. And I am excited about today because out of the three-part message series, today is actually my favorite message. And uh, and I know that God is going to speak to us powerfully today. Now, if you weren't with us last weekend, I don't want you to be confused, wondering, wait a minute, did we re, you know, open the church? Are we back at the building? Did I miss it? Actually, no, we are still having services strictly online. But what we're doing during this series that we're actually revisiting a message series that I preached in 2018 and it was recorded at our church building. And that's why I'm there. That's why you hear people there and responding to the message and everything else. But uh, but no, we're actually still strictly online. But uh, again, I invite you to lean in because today's message is very personal and it's going to be very practical. And I think it's going to apply to every single one of our lives. So lean in to see what God wants to speak to you today. Amen. So with that said, as a brief introduction, let us pray so that we can jump straight into the message. Amen. What else? Father, thank you for the honor and privilege that you give us to gather and to intentionally study your word. I pray, God, like every single week, that what is shared today is not heard as being my personal words, thoughts, or ideas, but God, allow us to hear your voice today. I pray for every person and every family that's represented under the sound of my voice, and I pray that you will meet us and speak to us, God, in a personal and powerful way so that we may experience your grace your love, and your transforming power. And God, I pray all these things, and I give you thanks, and I do it all in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. I hope that God's word speaks to you personally today. Second week of this series, talking about spiritual warfare. Last week, we kind of gave an introduction to the series, and I shared with you guys that spiritual warfare doesn't always look like the movies, but I was speaking with my wife this week and she's like, well, sometimes it doesn't. That's why I said it doesn't always because there is crazy stuff and supernatural and weird stuff and stuff flies across the room and people with supernatural strength and and all kinds of different things and all that is real. But day to day things, we don't see that every day. We don't see that type of Uh, paranormal or supernatural activity just driving home from work. You know what I'm saying? So we're talking about spiritual warfare in a more practical, maybe in more subtle ways that the enemy kind of attacks us in every day and just every moments of every day. And today I want to start talking about names. Today I want to start talking about names because names are very, very powerful, right? Names carry with them A lot of weight. I mean, when we think about some names, names like Albert Einstein, or we think about uh, we think about Adolf Hitler. Right. Or or to think about like Mother Teresa, which 
that's not her name, right? Her name is actually Agnes Ganya Boyachi. I think that's how, that's how you say it. But but each one of those names, like when these people were born, right? Albert Einstein or, or Hitler or, or, you know, like Adolf, those names didn't mean anything. There might have been other Adolfs before Adolf Hitler was born. But after their life was lived, those names now carry weight. They carry significance. They carry meaning for the good or the bad, right? That's why you don't see a lot of parents naming their kids Adolf. Hey, little Adolf, come here, right? Like, uh, so because, right? I heard this comedian talking about how people aren't reading their Bibles anymore, right? And he's like, and he said, yeah, I talked to this lady and she was like, yeah, meet my kids, Judas and, and Goliath. And he's like, that's not even the good names in the Bible. Like, you got to read your Bible, right? Not just open it up. Oh, I like Judas, right? So, uh, right, because names, they carry meaning. They carry weight. And, and again, um, the same with our kids, right? When, when you were naming your kids, I mean, there's rules when you got to name your kids, right? And that's one of the hardest things to do is choosing the name for your kids because, right, there's rules like, hey, no ex-boyfriend names, no ex-girlfriend names, right? You can't use any of those names. Oh, I really like that name. No, no, no. Can't use those, right? Uh, you can't use like um, crazy family member names, right? It's, I really like it. No, but I got an aunt and she's crazy, right? So we're not going to name our kid that or I got this cousin or whatever. Or just people that that just we didn't like, right? You, you, you talk about, oh, but this name for our baby is like, no, because I went to high school with this one dude and he was annoying, right? So because why? Because even each and every one of us, we, we, we know that names are incredibly powerful. I mean, just hearing certain names bring up memories, right? Because you knew a person with that name and you had this experience or, or, or it, it, I mean, they, can, they bring up memories. Certain names can bring up feelings, right? How you felt when you were with that person or when you experienced certain things. And, and the reason is because names equal identity, right? Names equal identity. We identify names with people. We identify names with events, with experiences. And, and as a pastor, I, um, I, I, you know, I meet a lot of people, right? At one time I didn't know any of you and I've met all of you and, and we meet a lot of people and, and, and I'm, I'm constantly meeting people and having new names, right? Come at me. And, and I, um, I struggle with remembering people's names, right? I read this article that said that when you meet somebody new, and you can apply this in your lives, when you meet somebody new for the first time, you wanna ask them their name, and then immediately say their name out loud, right? For you to like register it in, right? And like lock it in. Uh, but again, like I struggle with that. So if I'm constantly asking your name, or if I call you by the wrong name, just have you know some grace with me. I'm, I'm trying, like, I have, I have a good memory for certain things. Like, I'm, I'm good with, like, directions. Like, if I go to one place or you tell me where to, like, I can get there with no GPS or anything. I'm good remembering, like, stories or, like, analogies or illustrations. Like, if I listen to a sermon three years ago, I can still remember a certain example, which is good because it helps me do what I do or movies like I'm good with movies and it's a good thing because my, my wife is horrible remembering movies and I'm like remember we watched that movie and I tell her the title she's like no so I have to tell her like the whole plot right <laughs> oh yeah I do remember right so like I have good memory for that but with names like I struggle remembering names and and for whatever reason and, and you might be asking okay I need to get to the point like why are we talking so much about names all right, so the reason why I'm focusing and kind of bringing your mind to think about names, experiences, memories, about people's names and everything is because one of the tactics, one of the tactics of the enemy when it comes to spiritual warfare in our everyday lives is for him to call us or identify us by the wrong name, by the wrong name. Now, I'm not talking about your actual name, because trust me, with a name like Aníbal, I've been called the wrong name multiple, like every day, right? Like people call my house, they're like, oh, is your wife Annabelle there? It's like, no, I am Aníbal, right? Like, that's me, right? So, um, so I'm not talking about your actual name. What I'm talking about names, I'm talking about the events, the experiences. I'm talking about the memories 
that we all identify with that has brought shame into our lives, right? I'm talking about events, experiences, or memories that we identify with because names equal identity that we identify with that have brought in one way or another, in one moment or another, those experiences, those events, those memories have brought shame into our lives. And that is what the enemy wants to do. The enemy loves to keep, keep us tied to the things that bring shame into our lives. I was studying this week about shame and shame is one of the most powerful and dominating feelings or, or emotions that a person can have, right? And, and, I, and I know that if I ask in this afternoon in this room, if I ask how many he people here have ever done, have ever said, or have ever experienced something that has brought shame in your life that you are ashamed of. I'm sure that all of us can remember. A lot of us can go back to, a lot of us can, can recall something that we, that we said, something that we did, or just something that we experienced that brought shame into our life, that, that we are ashamed of. And uh, I read this article in, in Psychology Today that says that shame informs us of an internal state of inadequacy, right? Inadequacy, like I'm not inadequate, I'm not adequate, right? So informs us of an internal state of inadequacy, unworthiness, dishonor, regret, and notice this, or disconnection. Disconnection, meaning that we feel like nobody else has had this experience. Nobody else would understand. Nobody knows what I'm going through. We feel disconnected. Now, it's important for us to understand, and I, I don't have a lot of time to go deep into this, but a lot of times we, we mistake shame with guilt. But guilt is something different. When you feel guilt, it's because you've done something wrong, and a lot of times you feel like you have to make it right. Like you, you did something wrong, you said something wrong, and, 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 and a lot of times we try to correct that error. And we're like, you know what, I, I did this, or I, I remember I told you, and I, that was wrong, right? So, so guilt, it, it usually kind of pushes us to want to correct the error, but shame, shame doesn't push us to, to come to the light, to confess, to, to say something else. No, no, no. Shame creates this, this connection that we want to, we want to hide. The, the article continued to say, um, given that shame can lead us to feel though our whole self is flawed, right? Our whole self is flawed, bad or subject to, again, exclusion, it motivates us to hide. It motivates us to hide. So it's no wonder that shame avoidance can lead to withdrawal or to addictions that attempt to mask its impact. And that is why it's just so important. I mean, people say, well, what do I need church for? This is why you need church, right? Yes, you can watch it live online. You can watch it on Facebook or whatever, but here you have to come out of your shell. You have to come out and, and, and eventually when you meet people, when you, when you have relationships, you can get vulnerable, you can lower your guard and slowly you can start to heal, right? And, and, and that is the process. That is the importance of having community, having relationships, being part of the family of God. Because we talked about this last week. One of the tactics of the enemy, enemy is to get us into this pattern of harming ourselves. We talked about like cutting last week, right? Harming ourselves physically. But most, most of the time, we harm ourselves emotionally. We're critical. We're negative. We're anxious. We're depressed. And all of that, right? Um... Just, just harms our self, our being, our, our, our soul. And, and shame is a big, big part of it because the enemy, he wants to convince us that our past mistakes, that our failures, they're not just events that happen. They're not just events that occurred in our lives. No, no, no. He wants to convince us that all those failures, that those you know, things that we did, they're not just events that happen. It is who we are. It is who we are. You didn't just fail at something. No, no, no. You're a failure. You didn't just make a mistake. No, no, no. You're a mistake. You didn't just disappoint somebody. No, you are a disappointment. And, and, and it's so strong. I mean, in the Bible, Paul 
is one of the people, one of the godliest people that we know in the Bible. I mean, God used Paul incredibly, right? I mean, Paul um, planted churches. He wrote most of the New Testament, right? I mean, Paul was persecuted for his faith. He died, right, for his faith. Yet, during his life, in Romans 7, 24 and 25, he says, Oh, what a miserable person I am. What? Paul? You're a miserable person. What what hope do we have? You know what I'm saying? Like, you're a miserable person, but notice he says, who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And again, I I just want to call your attention to this verse that he says, who will set me free from from this life? From this thought pattern, from this this pattern of me hurting myself, thinking that I'm miserable, that I'm no good, that I'm a failure. Who will set me free? He didn't say what, right? He didn't say what will set me free because there is no self-help book. There is no pill. There is no program. There is no motivational uh, speech on, on, on positivity that can help us through this. No, no, no. Who will set us free? The answer, thank be to God that the answer is in Christ. The answer is in Jesus. Amen. So to to start and and as an introduction, like every week, I want to share just one thought or one idea. So if you don't hear anything else and, and you have to leave, this is my sermon in a sentence. If you are in Christ, if you have put your faith in Christ, the truth about you is that your identity is not what you do. My identity is not what I do. And that is either bad things or good things, right? Because I heard this wise teacher once said, he said, you should never base your identity on something that you can lose. Because a lot of things just, a lot of people say, well, you know, who are you? Well, I'm, you know, I'm a teacher. I'm a doctor. I'm a, I'm a boss. You know, I'm a father. Well, what happens if you lose your job, if you lose your career, if you lose, right? What happens? So never base your identity on something that you can lose. So my identity, and it's not based on what I do, good or bad. It's not based on what I do. My identity is based in who God says I am. All right. And if you have placed your faith in Christ, your identity is not in what you do, what you have done. It's in who God says that you are. And this is an incredible, incredibly powerful weapon for us to know, for us to know, because when the enemy attacks, we know, wait wait a minute, and we'll talk about this in one minute. But anyway, let's go ahead and read today's text. And um, and I want to share just a couple of truths today. So today we're going to be in Mark 5, verses 1 through 15. The Bible, remember last week, the disciples were in Capernaum and Jesus said, hey, I know it's evening, but let's go ahead and cross to the other side. And when they got there, they met this guy. All right. So we're going to continue this story. And it says that when they went across the lake to the region of Gerasenes, when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore. Not even with a chain, for he had often been chained hand and foot, and he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. So I just want to pause here for a minute, and and I want you to notice the condition of this man. The, The text just told us, first of all, that he was isolated. Right? He was living in the cemetery. Trust me, there's not a lot of people hanging out in the cemetery all the time. Right, So he was isolated. He was alone. He was hurting. He was tormented. It says that he would cry out, cut himself. I mean, he, he, would, he would, another version said that he would howl in the night, right? Almost like a wolf or whatever. And he was chained up. People would chain him up. So he would run around and chains be dragging. The text continues saying, that when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his, on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, what is your name? What is your name? 
My name is Legion, he replied, for we are men, he says. My name is Legion. Now, I've read this story countless times. I have heard this story. I have I've listened people preach and teach this story. And I never thought about this because when Jesus asked this guy, what is your name? We automatically assume, well, he's talking to the demons. He wants to know, like, who's the demon inside of him. But today I want to look at us. I want to change your paradigm a little bit. And I want you to think, well, maybe Jesus was just talking to the guy. He just wanted to know, hey, what, what is your name? But notice he didn't say, oh, my name is Ramon or Fernando, right? Like, no, no, no. But he said, my name is Legion. All right, Legion. Now, I want to call your attention that under the influence of the enemy, because we know that this guy was possessed, under the influence of the enemy, this guy introduced himself to Jesus and identified himself by his dysfunction, by his problem, right? By his, what, what was going on inside. And, and the very, the, I mean, in a similar way, I mean, we tend to do that ourselves right i mean we might not be like hey how you doing i'm a disappointment right like i mean we don't introduce ourselves like that but but in a in a, in a i mean we identify sometimes with with these names we identify with with maybe failure maybe you failed at a previous marriage or, or you tried to start your business you failed at that or you tried a relationship or or a school or you tried out for a team or or or, the, or, or this group or club or whatever and you and, and failure is something that you kind of identify with right maybe maybe disappointment maybe somebody told you you're a disappointment and you just carry that almost like a hello my name is and, and you won't say it but but that is something that the enemy attacks you with because that's that's a name that you identify with maybe we can talk about feeling unqualified that's something that i struggle with you know i think about you know the, the job that i do and, and and that i'm unqualified for and maybe maybe you were rejected for a job or in a relationship or for again a sports team or by a friend and and just unqualified or, or something or or just unfaithful or weak i mean because the truth is that shame comes in every size in every color come i mean shame shame comes in all forms and sizes i mean people have shame about maybe like a sexual past and and, and just experiences and and things that you know you shouldn't have done but it, they happen and, and you carry that shame or shame for simply not being a, a good wife or a good mother, not spending enough time. People f feel shame just about their physical appearance, right? I mean, you, you got married and then you got the happy 15, right? And then the happy 15 turned to happy 40 like me, right? So, like, I mean, you've gained weight and now your appearance just kind of brings shame and, and you hide and, and you, you have adopted this just this shameful, right, that you don't like to be in public. You think that people are judging you and looking at you. I mean, there's shame over past failures, whether it's financial or relational or, 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 or maybe shame can also come just via humiliation. And, and bullying or, or just somebody being very negative and critical and you're just, you're ashamed because somebody else told you that you are. So, I mean, shame comes in so many different forms and, and that is the tactic of the, the enemy, right? He wants to keep calling us by those wrong names, us being identified like this man. Jesus said, what's your name? Well, I'm Legion. I got a bunch of demons inside me. That's my identity right now. But again, remember, hey, my identity is not what I do. My identity is not in all of that. No, no, no. My identity is in who God says that I am. So... The story continues and he said um, that the demon begged Jesus again and again not to send them out of the area. The, the Bible says that a large herd of pigs was feeding on a nearby hillside and the demons begged Jesus, hey, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. Now, do you know why the demons went into the pigs? It's because there was no cats around, right? Because you know the cats are from the devil, right? They would have gone straight for the cats, but there was no cats around. 
Uh, so I'm just kidding. All right. So the, the story continues and he says, so Jesus gave them permission and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, uh, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. <laughs> Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. Now, verse 15 is, is key. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were afraid. All right. So we're going to take this text. And today I just want to share three quick truths about your shame, about my shame. Three quick truths or three truths about our shame. Number one, I want to let you know, I want to give you the good news that Jesus is not afraid of the unclean. All right. Jesus is not afraid of unclean things. All right. So again, um, we read the Bible a lot of things, a lot of times, and we, we read details and we just kind of skip over them or whatever. But there is a common theme during this whole story. Mark um, keeps bringing up this, this particular theme of unclean things. All right. If you remember last week, um, the disciples were in Capernaum. Jews live in Capernaum. Jesus said, let's cross over to the other side. On the other side lived the Gentiles. Now, Gentiles to the Jews were considered unclean. They were considered unclean. All right. When they crossed, if you remember the story, they arrived at a graveyard. Right. Dead things were considered unclean to the Jews. Uh, one, I mean, over and over again in the Old Testament. The, the teachings of God says you can't touch something clean because if you're clean and you touch something that is dead, you will become unclean because dead things were considered unclean. On top of that, so there's Gentiles are unclean. There is a, a cemetery, right? Tomb, whatever that's unclean. Some demon possessed guy comes also unclean, right? Demon possession and, and I mean, people didn't want, they, they would chain this guy studying this week. The reason that he was chained is because the religious system in that time thought that the way to free a person of, of, a, of a demon or, or being possession of possession is to chain them up and constantly just throw buckets of cold water on them. All right, that's going to help, right? So, um, so again, they're just considered unclean by the Jews, by the religious system. And then on top of that, like if that's not enough, Mark wants us to know that there was a bunch of pigs in the area, right? Pigs were unclean animals to the Jews. They didn't eat pigs. They didn't want to associate with pigs. They didn't do anything with pig, pigs. Um, that's why the pigs were in the Gentile area. So why? What does this mean? Again, this is good news that Jesus... He's not afraid of unclean things, of the unclean. And that is great news because if he's not afraid of the unclean, that means that he's not afraid of me. That he's not afraid of you and your uncleanliness. Is that a word? Sounds good to me. It is today, right? Uh, of your, your, your thought life, your, your, your pattern of living, your, well, your experiences, whatever. He is not afraid, right? The, the, the truth is that no matter what you have done, it doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter what you have experienced. Jesus is not afraid to go into your life, to bring healing, to bring right uh, sanity into, into your life. He's not afraid of your past. He is not afraid of your sin. Um, I heard this preacher talk, and, uh, and he was talking about how many of us, it would do us well to grow and to learn uh, or to grow in our demon theology. Demon theology. Now... I, I continue listening carefully because you, you got to listen careful to things, right? You can't just believe everything that everyone tells you. I, I continue to listen carefully, but he, he did make some interesting points. And he was talking about that every, every time that Jesus encountered a demon or a person possessed, that demon knew exactly who Jesus was knew exactly and confessed who Jesus was. And we see this in this story, right? The Bible says that when he saw Jesus, this guy from a distance, 
He ran and fell on his knees in front of him and he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? He knew exactly who Jesus was. And when it comes to you and me and when it comes to our shame, if we want to live free and if we want to live in the new identity that Christ has for us, then it would do us well to fall on our knees in front of Christ and declare, hey, God, what do you want me to do? You are God. You are my Savior. You are my God. You are the one who tells me who I am. Praise Him that He's not afraid of my impure heart and believe that He can set us free. Amen? So it is good news that Jesus is not afraid of the unclean because that means He's not afraid of me. Number two, I want to let you know that Jesus hath authority over my shame. Jesus has authority over, over our shame. And I just want to call your attention to just a couple of details in this story, right? In verses 3, 4, and 9, says that this guy, he lived in the tombs. No one could bind him anymore, right? Like he was just too strong, um, not even with chains, right? If he had often been chained that he would break the chains. He'd break the iron off, off of his feet. The Bible says that no one was strong enough to subdue him. When Jesus asked him, what's your name? He said, Legion, for we are many. And I learned this week that Legion is actually a term that was used in the Old Testament and just in old history um, to describe a body of soldiers. A legion was approximately 6,826 soldiers. So there's a lot of demons in this guy. I don't know how many, but I mean, he said Legion because we're many. This is what Legion means is 6,826. 26 whatever was inside of him and I don't know about you but if there's a war going on and there's almost 7,000 people on one side and one guy on the other I don't know about you but I'm putting my money on the 7,000 you know what I'm saying unless that one person is Jesus because over and over again notice notice the wording right in in, in verses 5 and 6 it says when Jesus saw him this guy, I mean, this guy that nobody could subdue, nobody could control him. He not even with chains. He falls on his knees in front of Jesus. Right. He, he, he shouts, what do you want with me? Don't torture me. Right. And I, and verse 10 and 11. He says that he begged Jesus, please send me this way. Right. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. And again, Jesus Gave them permission. Who has the authority here? Who has the authority? The 7,000 demons or Jesus? Jesus? Right? Because a lot of times we think of Jesus and the devil. Like they're going at it. Like, oh, I wonder who's going to win. Right? Like they're just like, oh, let's go. I'm winning. Because that's what it looks like. When we, go, when we look at the news, when we look at society, we think, man, God, what's going on? It seems like just darkness and just immorality and things are just crazy right now. Like, what are you doing? Are, are you sure? Are, are you sure that you win at the end? Because this is what a lot of people think spiritual warfare is like. Like, it's Jesus and the demon, like, fighting it out. But I want to let you know that Jesus has authority over Satan. It, it, it actually looks more like this. Right? Right? Like, splat! Right? Like... Trust me, Jesus is victorious. There is none like him. There is none above him, right? And, and again, uh, I, I'm so thankful that there's verses in the Bible that say, Romans 8, 31, look, if God is for us, if God is in our favor, who can be against us? So when the enemy comes and attacks you, no, 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 you're a failure, you're a disappointment, you will never be enough or whatever. No, 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 I'm not what I do. I'm not what I've done. I'm not what I've experienced. I am who God says I am. He is on my favor and he has authority over my shame. A lot of times we live ashamed and we live in closets. We live in because we focus more on our shame than we focus on our Savior. But I want to let you know Jesus has authority over your shame. Right. And I want to teach you two quick, just biblical words, just very, very important. And are the words condemnation and conviction. I want to show you the difference, the meaning and the difference between these two words. Condemnation and conviction. All right. Now, condemnation. Number one, I want you to know that comes from the enemy. 
Condemnation comes from the, 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 the devil. And a lot of times it has to do with our past. Right? And, and condemnation looks like you're trying for a new job or you're starting this new project or, or, or you're in a new relationship or you want to just do well in your marriage. And condemnation says, well, you've tried that before and you failed. What's different this time? Why, why, why are you trying to get in shape? You, get, you, you said the diet starts on Monday every week, right? That's what condemnation looks like, right? It's discouragement. It's just this thing. And, 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 and condemnation comes from the enemy. It has to do with the past. And its purpose is to keep us from God. It's to keep us away from God. Now, conviction. Conviction is different. Conviction comes from God. Conviction, ha conviction has to do with the present, with the here and now. Like it, 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 conviction seems like it, what it looks like is, oh, I, I'm, I'm about to cheat in my test or I'm about to flip this guy off that cut me off and, and I sh maybe I shouldn't do it. Conviction is like, hey, maybe you did that before, but now you're a believer, you're a son of God, and maybe you shouldn't do it. Conviction is, is that thing that before you used to say whatever came to mind, you used to lie, you used to do whatever, and you didn't even think about it. But now you have this little, this conscience, where did that come from? God. It has to do with your, your activity, your, your actions now, and the purpose of conviction is to keep you close to God. When the enemy wants to draw you away, you feel that conviction. He says, no, 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 no. Let's just stay over here. And this is so important for us to know because when the enemy whispers in your ear, right, and calls you immoral, unqualified, or sinful, I mean, I know I have to deal with this. I have to battle this, right? When, when God calls me, and, and with the past that you've done, and with everything you've done, and, and, and you're not qualified to do this, what kind of education do you have, right? Right? I mean, with the sin in my past and your failures, I mean, the enemy whispers this thing. And, 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 and again, I mean, everything that the enemy accuses me of, the truth is that they're just bullets that I've put in his hand. And for a lot of us, we can identify with that. A lot of the things that the, the, the enemy doesn't have to like make up stuff. No, no, no. A lot of the things that we're accused of are bullets that we've given them. But... I'm so thankful that the word of God says, look, Romans 8, 1 and 2. Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin, a.k.a. shame. It has freed you from the power of shame that leads to to what? To isolation, to hiding, to, to all these things that leads to death. And because Jesus has authority over my shame, if he says that I'm free, I'm not. My identity is not based on what I do. My, my identity is based on who God says that I am. And if he says that I'm free, yeah, I might have to deal with the consequences of my actions. I might have to face up to the things that I've done. But I don't have to carry that shame with me. I can leave that behind and walk as a new creature in Christ because God has set me free. Amen. Amen? So three, number three, and to finish, um, I want to let you know that Jesus has made preparations to cover your shame. Jesus, he is not afraid of the unclean. Jesus has authority over our shame. And Jesus has made preparations to cover our shame. He made preparations to cover my shame. The last verse that we read in this story was Mark 5 15, where the Bible says that when, when they came, right, the people that the, the pigs all killed themselves, the people ran off to tell the people they came back. And it says that they saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. They were afraid, um, but they saw him and he was dressed. Now, many scholars believe that the fact that the text focuses and, and kind of emphasizes on the fact that now they saw him, and he was dressed more than likely is that this guy was running around, butt naked, chained up. We get the first streaker in the Bible, right? Like this guy was probably running around naked in the cemetery with chains and everything. 
And, and the reason that it says that he was he was dressed is because more than likely he was naked. He was just the crazy naked man in town, right? The people were used to it. You know, people that visit the town, it's like, what's going on? Oh, that's just the crazy naked guy in town, right? Like the people just knew that that's what, who he was, right? He's just crazy and, and he's just naked in the, in, the, um, in the cemetery. Now in the scriptures, over and over again, again, we see this theme of nakedness being equivalent with shamefulness, right? Nakedness equals shamefulness. And just a couple of examples. I mean, in Genesis 3, 7, if you remember the story when, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit, at that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt what? Shame at their nakedness, right? Um, at Naum, um, 3, 5 says, uh, I am your enemy, says the Lord of heaven's army. And now I will lift there's weird stuff in the Bible. I will lift your skirt and show all the earth your nakedness and shame. Right? Uh, Revelation um, 3.18. Also, buy white garments from me so you will not be shamed by your nakedness. So we, we see this theme. Shame equals, right? Uh, nakedness equals shame. And, and again, um, you can even feel shame, uh, vergüenza ajena, right? Like, like shame for someone else. Like I remember when I was young, I used to be, uh, I used to be member like at gyms, gymnasiums, and stuff like that. And the older the the guys get, the nakeder they are at the gym, right? Like they're just running around naked, and and it's like that's why I don't belong to a gym, right? Like ah, uh, so. I mean, nakedness, it just brings shame. And, and, and we've all had the experience like, oh, she shouldn't be wearing that, right? Like, give it wins, all right? Like, I mean, the shamefulness, uh, it has to do with our nakedness, right? And, and, and again, if I were to ask how many people here um, would change something about their physical appearance, I'm sure that all of us would say, I would change something because there's part of all of us, right? In our nakedness, there's part of all of us that are ashamed of certain parts of our body. And I, 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 I want to emphasize again with Adam and Eve, when they sinned, the Bible says that when God called them out, he called out the man and he said, where are you? And, and the whole, you know, the whole exchange happened and, and, um, they didn't fess up or whatever, but it's so beautiful that the Bible says that the Lord God made clothing from animal skins and Adam uh, for Adam and his wife. So God was incredibly involved. I mean, he was the first designer, right? Like fashion designer. That was God, right? He, 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 he fashioned something to cover their nakedness, to cover their shame. And I, and I emphasize nakedness because I believe that Jesus, he made preparations to cover this guy. Um, I had never thought about where the clothes came for this guy. I mean, studying this week and, and focusing on, on the fact that people saw him and they saw him clothes. So probably he was naked before. Where did the clothes come from? And before I was just like, well, I mean, probably the disciples, they took off a jacket here. They took off, you know, somebody, whatever they cut off. They did something to cover him up. But studying this week, I was just this, this detail. And again, this is, this is all speculation. And I can't give you that this is solid theology, but I love this thought. I love this thought because remember last week, I taught you that Jesus hears our cry, that the reason that that, that Jesus said, hey, let's go over to the other side because I, I believe that there's somebody that's hurting over there. And there's this detail that says that when they were crossing over, Jesus was sleeping at the back of a boat with his head on a cushion. Now, this is funny to me because Jesus was the one that said in the evening, hey, let's cross over to the other side. And then he falls asleep. It's like the person that says, no, nah, let's just drive all night. And then he sleeps right in the car. It's like, right. So it's like, Jesus, what's going on? But maybe it's to bring our attention to the fact that Jesus was sleeping with his head on a cushion. What's a cushion doing on a fishing boat? 
what's a cushion doing on, on a fish? I mean, this wasn't a yacht with like decorative pillows, right? Or whatever. What was a cushion doing on, a, on just a blue collar work boat? Well, these scholars and theologers, theolog people that study the Bible, maybe they suggest, well, maybe before they crossed over, Jesus prepared maybe some clothing to take to this guy to cover his nakedness and to cover his shame. How beautiful, how powerful to know that, that Jesus doesn't just want to forgive you. He wants to cover your shame. He doesn't want to just get you into heaven. He wants you to be free and to live an abundant life here on earth. To have thriving relationships, a thriving marriage, just a life that honors him. He doesn't want you to be bogged down by, by you attaching your identity to your failures or, or, or things that you've done or whatever. No, no. You are God's righteousness. You are clean. You are his child. And I love the fact that John 3.17, we focus so much on John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So that whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but have eternal life. But how powerful is the fact that John 3, 17 says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. No, he sent his son into the world to save it. He sent his son into the world, but to save the world through him. So again, Jesus, he doesn't just want to forgive you. He wants to cover your shame and he has made preparations to do that. How did he do that? By living the perfect life that you and I couldn't live. By dying the death that you and I deserved. And by rising up at the third day victorious over death, sin and the grave. And through his life, death and resurrection, you and I can be free. So when the enemy attacks you, calling you by the wrong name, calling you a failure, a disappointment, ungodly, unqualified, you say, hey, my identity is not based on what I do. No, my identity is based on who God says that I am. He's not afraid of my uncleanliness. He has authority over my shame. And he has made preparations to cover my shame and help me live in freedom. Amen. Thanks again for joining us at Church Online. I hope that you are walking away with some powerful truths that you can embrace and that you can remember when you find yourself in the middle of spiritual warfare. When the enemy condemns you, when he convicts you, I hope that you can remember that you, your identity is not tied to what you do, whether good things or bad things, but instead is tied to who God says that you are. Amen. You are loved. You are forgiven. You are redeemed. You are his child. Amen. Remember your identity in Christ. And man, I'm so thankful that Jesus is not afraid of unclean things because it means that he's not afraid of our sin past, present, or even future sin. He is not afraid. He has authority over our shame. But more than anything, I'm thankful that he has made preparations to cover our shame by living the sinless life we could not live, by dying the death that we deserve, but more importantly, by rising up again, victorious over death, sin, and the enemy. And through his death and his victory, we can live in victory and we can live in freedom. So again, I hope that you're walking away with some powerful truths that you can remember and that you can embrace the next time you find yourself in spiritual warfare. Amen. If you are with us today and you have never placed your faith in Jesus, when we talk about, you know, embracing your identity in Christ and, and all this other stuff, maybe you don't have that and you don't really know what that is. Maybe your identity is still tied to your past or still tied to your shame or things that you have done or things that you have experienced. I want to encourage you today to to put your faith in Jesus. He 
died to give you an abundant life. He has so much to offer you. Um, he wants you to live. He doesn't just want to take you to heaven. He wants you to live in freedom here on earth. He wants to give you purpose, joy, and, and, and a meaning. Amen. Meaning for life. So if that's you today, I want to invite you to lean in and to, to, to place your faith in Christ because an instant of faith can literally transform the rest of your life like it did mine. So if that's you right there where you are, just calm your thoughts and calm your heart and just close your eyes and repeat these, these simple words. Now, this prayer is not magic and it's not this prayer that saves you, but I believe that God knows you. He knows where you are. And if you seek him, you will find him. So right there where you are, just say these simple words. Just say, Jesus, I believe that you are God. I believe that you lived the sinless life that I haven't been able to live. I believe that you died the death of a sinner because you died in my place. You died for my sins. And I believe that you rose again from the dead on the third day. Jesus, today I repent of my sins and I open up my heart and I invite you to come into my life. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Help me to live the rest of my days for you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you prayed that simple prayer by faith, I believe that you have been born again. Your sins have been forgotten. Past, present, and future sins are gone, and you are now a child of God. I encourage you to share your decision with somebody right there where you are. Just type it in the chat. Today, I decided to follow Jesus. I know that our church and our community would love to congratulate you on the best decision that you have ever made, and I want to say welcome to the family of God. Amen. Thank you again to everybody for joining us today. I hope that you have a beautiful rest of your day and a great week. I also want to remind you of the different meetings and activities that we have during the week. Tuesday mornings at 6 a.m., remember that we have prayer from 6 to 7 a.m. We gather to pray for one another, to pray for everything that is going on, and it's via Zoom. So if you're interested, please let us know so we can send you the Zoom information. Also, on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m., we have Life Group. Um, my wife and I are leading that group, and, uh, and man, we're having such a great time studying God's Word together. I hope that you can join us. And the next Sunday at, six, at, uh, at 10, 15 a.m. before the service, again, we are gathering to to pray together, to socialize a little bit before the service. It's a lot of fun. I hope that you can make it. So again, thank you for joining us today. I pray that you have a great rest of your day and a beautiful week. And God willing, I will see you next Sunday. Take care.